All right. So we've been talking about types. Really, the important takeaway, right, is that ints are whole numbers. Floats can be floating point numbers. Floats can hold much larger values than ints because they save the number internally as scientific notation, exponential notation. One thing we haven't really mentioned is that floats can get rounding errors in a way that ints don't, but I'm not going to give you any examples of that, but there will be something where, like, you were expecting it to be 4, and it says 3.999998025 or whatever. It's just a rounding error due to the way the math operations are, and it's not a problem specific to this language. Java and Python, a lot of other languages, will exhibit the same thing. It's just because floating point math can be imprecise, little bitty round off errors. So, if you're doing operations of, on the same type, using operators on the same type, like if you do A plus B, and they're of the same type, that's totally great. The result you get will be the same type. So, if A and B are ints, then the result is an int. If A and B are floats, the result is a float. That's pretty easy. It's a little bit trickier if they are of different types. If one is an int and one is a float, it, the one that is an int will be upgraded to be a float. And there's kind of a hierarchy. But basically, you can't downgrade a float to be an int and do accurate math on it because you'd lose a decimal point. Like if it was 2.5 plus 3, you don't want that 2.5 rounded down just to be 2 and then 2 plus 3 equal to 5. Instead, you, you want to maintain, you want to promote the less accurate one to the more accurate one. And when I say you want to, it's what C++ does automatically. But if one is a float and the other is an int, the int gets promoted, converted. Coerced is a word that this silly book causes it, calls it, to, the, to a float. So example. Int A is equal to 2, float B is equal to 2.5, C out A plus B. Inside the computer, it can't add ints and floats without some kind of conversion. They have to be the same. Now, we don't have to do anything about that. It happens automatically. The int, which is A, gets converted to a float. So instead of being 2, it's equal to 2.0. And 2.0 plus 2.5 is 5.5. So this would print 5.5. The int, which is A, gets converted to a float. So rather than 2, it adds 2.0. Now is there a difference? To our eyes, there's not. But to the way the computer works, there is a difference. One difference being that... Uh, you can get rounding errors, you know, if you're doing floating point math, but you know, we really can't avoid that. It'd be very small. Here's the hierarchy of types. Ranked by the largest number they hold. The long double holds more than a double, which holds more than a float. An unsigned long, and I remember talking about unsigned longs, unsigned numbers can be twice as large, but they can't go negative holds more than a long, which holds more than an int, unsigned int, which holds more than an int. So if you are doing math and you're adding a double to a long, the long will be upgraded to a double so that the math can occur. If you're doing a float plus a long double, the float will get upgraded to be a long double in order for the math to occur. So there's our little list of hierarchies. Lower grade types get promoted, converted, coerced as they call it, to higher level types for the purpose of doing the math. So if you do double x is equal to that and you do long y is equal to that and then you try to see out x plus y or x times y, or whatever. These are not of the same type, so one of them has to be converted. It makes no sense to convert a double, which is a floating point value, 
you know, I might have a five there or some important bit of data down to a long, so the long gets upgraded to be a double. So then it's adding, so the y, the long, gets upgraded to a double. So it's is 500.0 plus, you know, whatever. So we'll print, there we go, like that. Type coercion is automatic conversion of an operand to another data type. There's promotion and then there's demotion. Promotion is what we see. Coercion rules. Anything smaller than an int, like a care, a short, an unsigned short, gets promoted to an int for math. The lower level one is promoted to a higher level one. And when you're using the equal sign, the type of the expression on the right gets converted to the type of the variable on the left, which makes sense. If you have this, int x is equal to f, where f was declared to be a float. It wouldn't make any sense to try to convert f to a float to store into x because x is an int, so the conversion has to be the uh, f gets converted into an x. Now that looks kind of odd, and I'm, a, I'm not really a, completely convinced that it works that way, so I'm going to test it out. Let's do that. Float f is equal to 3, int x is equal to f, c out x. Let's see how that works. See if that converts it successfully or not. It should give me an error according to my way of thinking. Or it might not. It might not do anything. What are you doing? Here we go. It's giving me an error. Conversion from float to int. Possible loss of data. Well, that makes sense because if we try to turn 3.5 into an int, we'd lose a 0.5. So if the conversion is a demotion, if, it, if the conversion you are trying to get it to do is a demotion, it'll give you an error message. And you have to force it to do what's known as an explicit cast. An explicit cast is when you tell the compiler, oh, it really is okay. I really want you to do this conversion even though it's an error. And so there are several different syntaxes for explicit casts, but here's the one I want you to remember. The other ones are good to remember for future classes, but this is the one I want you to remember in here. This says take f, do whatever is necessary to turn it into an int. And in this case, doing whatever is necessary means rounding it down. So where it says 3.5, after the conversion, it's going to be 3. So now that I run it, It got converted to 3. So if the conversion across the equal sign, if you're putting it into a lower grade format, a format that holds a smaller value or doesn't hold a floating point, then if you want that conversion to happen without giving it, getting an error message, then you have to do an explicit cast. Some languages won't even let you do that. You get flat out get an error message and it won't compile until you go in and you put the cast. Java is one of those languages. So let's add that to our notes. So conversion rules. Lower grade very data types are upgraded, promoted to higher grade, according to our little chart here. Everything below an int goes up to an int, which includes shorts and cares. And then the other rule is across the equal sign. The left hand side of an equal sign is converted to the same type as the right hand side. If this would cause data loss, 
then this is flagged as a compile error or warning. You can fix that error with a cast. So why is this an error right here? I've kind of stated it already, but take a look at it again. Rewind in your mind back to two minutes ago and tell me why that statement is not a good statement. Because integers and floats don't necessarily get along. Yeah. Specifically, floats have fractional components that an integer can't carry. And also, a float can be much larger than an int. So it's going to say possible data loss. Like if this was more than 9 billion or something like that, if it was 10 billion, then it wouldn't fit into a, to an ant. But we can tell it, we know better than you. I want you to do it anyways with a cast. Here's what the cast looks like. You put the data type inside parentheses. This is called casting. Casting to an int. You can also cast to a float, a double, a long, whatever you need to. This tells the compiler, I'm smart enough, doggone it, I'm good looking, I can do it. Go ahead and do it. So uh, the compiler will do it without error. And if it's stupid, if you made a mistake, well, no, problem. it doesn't care. The compiler just isn't going to tell you that it's an error anymore. I know the consequences. And what are the consequences? Well, if it was a fractional, if it was 4.1, it's not going to be 0.1 after the conversion. You can't magically store a decimal inside of an int data type. All right, overflow and underflow. Overflow is when data gets too large to be held, and underflow is when data gets to be too small. And I'm pretty sure I showed you all the Pac-Man screen that gets garbaged at, 200, at level 256. That's because the maximum of a byte is 255, and so it rolled over, it overflowed, and generated an error. Type casting. Here's a different syntax for casting. I just like the one where you use parentheses, int into parentheses, but this is a different type. I mean, a different way of doing it. I would have to do a little bit of a research to see why this might be recommended. It's like when they invented C++, they tacked this way on as an alternate to doing INT. They replaced it, and then later on they went back and they put the uh, parentheses INT, that syntax, back in at popular demand. So I don't know if they're exactly equivalent or if there's a reason. So you could do it like this. Now that syntax looks pretty goofy to me. Uses a syntax a style of nomenclature that we haven't done yet, which is using those uh, angle, angle braces. Okay, you can use equal sign to initialize or to set a value to multiple variables like this. 5 is equal to z is equal to y is equal to x. The order in which they get done is like this. 5 gets copied into z, which then gets copied into y, which then gets copied into x. Is there a really strong reason for doing that? Well, if you want to initialize a bunch of things at the same value, I guess that's okay. This is what's known as a combined assignment. There is a shortcut for this. Instead of saying sum is equal to sum plus 1, you can do sum plus equals 1. Or you can do x is equal to x minus 3. You can replace that with x minus equals 3. Some, some places call that compound operators. This text is calling them combined assignment operators. It's a shorthand. Sum is equal to sum plus 1 can be sum, uh, shortened down to sum plus equals 1. It's just a faster way of typing it. And it can even run slightly a little bit faster because this variable only occurs once in it, so it only has to be... The address for it only has to be dereferenced once while it's executing it. Maybe you save a nanosecond, maybe not, probably not really. 
So here are the combined assignment operators. You can use plus equals, minus equals, multiply equal, divide equal, or even uh, modulus equals. So plus equal, minus equal, times equal, divide equal, and modulus equal are shortcuts. X is equal to X plus 1. You can replace with X plus equals 1. Y is equal to Y minus 10. can be replaced with Y minus equals 10. Z is equal to Z times 3. You can say Z times equals 3. And there's an even shorter form than that, just X plus plus and X minus minus. That is the same as X plus equals 1, which is the same as X is equal to X plus 1. Skip this formatting output chapter right now. Using CIN to input a string can cause a problem. And the reason for that is, is it only gets one token, one word, and stores it into the string. So if I wrote code like this, string name, and then I did CIN into name, they could only type a first name it would ignore the last name, or the last name would still wind up being an input buffer for the next thing to come along, and it would be wrong. So there's an alternate that you can use in order to get that out, in order to get that to work. So if I wanted to allow them to type their whole name, C out, please enter first and last name. Let's prove it to ourselves that I'm not lying. I'm going to make a string called name, and then I'm going to type in the name, and then I'm going to see out hello, comma, followed by the name. Let's make sure that works, or it doesn't work. There were build errors. What are my build errors? Oh, I forgot the L. I just put E&D. By the way, there's a more elegant way of doing this system pause thing. You can use um, one of these functions, like get line, that I'm just about to show you. All right, please enter first and last name. Joe Schmo. It says, hello, Joe. I wanted the whole word. I wanted both of those names stored in that string. It didn't let me. What's happening is, is that there might be something else, like at, um, let's say we wanted their address now. Please enter your address. Now let's read that into the string. CIN into address. And then let's print out their address. See out you live at, followed by their address. This is looking all plausible, but it's not going to work. So my name is Joe Schmo. I live at one, okay, well, that totally botched. I didn't even get to type in my address. Let's look at that again. My name is Joe Smith. It says, hello, Joe, please enter your address. You live at Smith. Totally messed up. And the, only, and the reason why is because this is tokenizing the input, meaning it's reading in everything between spaces, and it's just grabbing the first thing. The first thing between spaces was the first name, so that got stored there. The second thing between spaces was the last name, so that got stored there. So we want a version of this that will read in an entire line. They type in two names or three names or four names or an entire address and then hit enter. And we want that stored in our variable. So instead of using CIN arrow arrow, if you want an entire line of data, more than one word of data, you use get line. 
And the syntax for that looks like this. This is the bad way, so I'm going to comment it out. We don't want to do it that way. Instead, we want to do get line, and we pass in cin and the name. And the syntax looks a little bit different. We're calling a function. This is a function, and it requires two arguments, two parameters. The first parameter being the input stream that we want to read from. The second parameter being the variable that we want to fill. So that fixes that one. And let's do the same for where we read in the address. So we need to replace this line as well. Whoops, not that one, that one. What's this one going to be? Making it look exactly like this one, except for the different variable name. Get line. Get line. Same CIN, stream. Comma, and then address. The variable. Correct. There we go. Now it should work correctly. When I run it, it should let me type in a first and a last name. Jeff T. It says, hello, Jeff T. Please enter your address, 193 South Main. And it says you live at 193 South Main. So that's how you get an entire line of data at a time with CIN. Do you care? Well, you know, if you're just asking them to type in their age, you know, if you're just getting a single bit of data, no, you don't care. But if you're asking them to type in things with spaces like names or addresses or something like that, yeah, you absolutely do care. Okay, okay we're going to go back and do the review in just a little bit. There is also a way to read a single character in, which is to use cin.get. cin.get lets them type in one character. So let's demonstrate that, and then we will, we will be done with this. So we're going to call a character called, I don't know, ch. And we're going to do cin.get, not gen, cin.get, print the cch. And then let's print that out. You typed, followed by that character. Let's, let's tell them what they need to do. So C out, press a key. Let's put that out before the system pause. So name, Joe Smith, address 123 Main, press the key, I'll just hit enter, it says you typed enter. So you could replace this call to pause with two line, with three lines of code, one that says C out, press the key, you, you know, or press enter. And then the next one would read a character. That would actually be the kind of thing where it was press any key to continue. Run it once more. Joe Blow, 123 main. Press any key to continue. You press Y. Whoop, that didn't work. I have to actually hit enter. Okay. So press enter to continue. So this one gets a single character. This one gets an entire line. This one return gets a string. The line is a string. The character is a car. Strings are defined with double quotes. If you wanted to create a string yourself, like you wanted to create a variable called um, school, instead of equal to rows, you use double quotes. If you wanted to define a car, a character, you use single quotes. Mixing cin arrow arrow and cin.get can cause input errors that are hard to detect. So sometimes you'll need to tack this in. Sometimes you'll need to throw in a call to cin.ignore. 
How will you know you need that? Because it won't give you a chance to type in something next. Of course, it's not giving us an example. If you ever get to the point where you type in something and you hit return and then it skips the, ability, the uh, option of typing in the next thing that you need to, add a cin.ignore to it. I'm sorry I don't have an example cooked up for you right now. We could try to force it. Let's uh, see if we can force it. Go back to our program and let's move this inner first and last name to after that press any key to continue business. So we're going to say press any key to continue, then we're going to ask them for their first and last name, then we're going to say press any key to continue, and then we're going to ask them for their address and tell them where they live after we ask them that. Now it's possible that this will be broken, that this won't work correctly. Press any key to continue, enter, press first and last name, Jeff T, hello Jeff T, press enter to continue, enter your address. Now see, it's not messing up. But if it was, if it was skipping the option for me to type in the address, if it was just going past that, then I would fix that by adding cin.ignore. I could go here, right to here, right before we call. Oh, that's because I wasn't mixing this. And this. The way that you get into trouble is by using arrow arrow and one of the other functions. That may cause it to mess up. Let's give it a shot. Press enter to continue. Please enter first last name. Now, since I made it error, error, I can really only enter one thing. So I'm going to enter Jeff. Please press enter to continue. Please enter your address. Notice it blipped right past that. That press enter to continue. It didn't even give me a chance to do that. So if I wanted to fix that to make sure it paused there, I would add a cin.ignore before that second one. Let's give that a, chop, a shot. So right here above that second press enter to continue, I'm going to type in cin.ignore and see if that fixes the problem. Press enter to continue. Okay. Enter name, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Press enter to continue. That fixed it. So if you ever find it skipping an input field, not giving you a chance to type in some input, put in a cin.ignore before the arrow arrow and it'll work. I feel like I should be putting these in the notes, but it seems like So what's wrong with it as written here? What's wrong with that statement C I N error error name? The fill they're gonna get your first name. Exactly. Wrong, only gets first name. So instead, what do we use to fix that? Get line. Get line. Yep, get line, CIN, comma, followed by the variable name. You can also use CIN.get to get a character. But they still have to hit enter. Everybody who turned in the review, go ahead and open it back up, and we're going to all go over it by hand, and if you made any mistakes, you can correct them and go ahead and re-upload them. That's why everything looks wrong. Or the wrong class. All right. So the review worksheet. To download it, you just click on your little attachment over here. However, I don't have an attachment there. I didn't upload it. I meant to. So 
I've copied somebody else's. Let's see if they're all right. All righty. Did you watch it? If so, type yes into the box below. Okay. Everybody watch the video, right? Okay. Assume you have these values. Int x is 2, int y is 5, float a is 2, float b is 5. What would be the value of these expressions? Fill in the table. The first are done for you. Do them in your head. Okay. So x plus y, these are both ints, so the answer is an int. 7. A plus B. These are both floats. So the answer is a float. X plus Y times 10. Well, what gets done first? Multiplication. Yeah, multiplication. So Y is 5, so 5 times 10 is 50, plus 2 is 52. Again, multiplication gets done first. So that's 2 times 5, which is 10, plus 10, which is 20. Here we have parentheses forcing the issue. Just remember, PMDAS, P-M-D-A-S, parentheses happen before anything else. So X plus Y is 7 divided by, oh, this was such a mistake. I did not mean to do this. I did not mean to do a divide, get a divide by 0 error. Let's uh, run it and see what it does. Hint x is equal to 5, or y is equal to 2, or maybe it was vice versa. See out that. Let's see what we get. Exception. Okay. So, it was okay to put 0 there, but really, dividing by 0 is undefined, so this is actually an error. And I didn't mean to put that in there. All righty. Y divided by X. 5 divided by 2. Well, these are both integers. So the result is going to be an integer. So it gets rounded down. The answer would not be 2.5. It's just 2. However, these are floating points. So no rounding will occur. 5.0 divided by 2.0 is 2.5. And now we're going to do the modulus. 5 modulus 2. Well, 2 goes into 5 two times with a remainder of 1. Is it 2 modulus 5 or 5 modulus 2? Good question. It's 2 modulus 5. So that's a remainder of 2. So 5 modulus 2, which is what I mistakenly looked at the problem as. 2 goes into 5 2 times with a remainder of 1. But 2 modulus 5, 5 goes into 2 0 times with a remainder of 2. 2. You can't have a remainder that's larger than the number you started off with. It's larger than 2. You have a piece of pizza with only two slices in it. You send five people in to eat it. Only two people get slices. Yeah, so, so if you wanted to keep it a round number, all five people get zero slices with two left over. Because five cannot, is not larger than two. That's probably a dumb example. That made sense. <laughs> okay. Convert these to base 10. Now, I threw in a little bit of a, of a loop by throwing in the fifth bit so we couldn't just hit our lookup chart. But you can do that anytime this. You see a 1 in the, in the first bit here, it's a 16. So that's 16 plus 2 plus 1, that's 19. This is 16 plus 4, which is 20, plus 1, which is 21. This is all of them. 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, which is in fact 31. And this is 8 plus 4 plus 2, which is indeed 14. Match these up. A single letter with single quotes around it is a character. Something with double quotes around it, whether it's a single letter, no letters, or a whole bunch of letters, is a string. A 1 is an int. Excuse me, something without a decimal point is an int. 
unless you tack an L onto it, which makes it a long, but I didn't throw that in, and I'm not going to on the exam. At 1.0, it's got a decimal point, so that means it's a float, and true or false are bools. Write a line of code that uses CIN to store a value into X. There we go, CIN, arrow, arrow, X. Now assume that the user typed in 3. Write a line of code that uses C out to display the variable in the format below. The value of X is, and this is correct, C out, the value of X is, arrow, arrow, X. And then to get it to go to the next line, tacking on an ENDL is a great thing. Convert this equation into a line of functiona. What? That's supposed to be functional. That looks like a good name for a programming language or software or something. Yeah. Hi, I'm so lead software developer on the functiona project. Okay, functional C++. Pardon me? Um, I wanted this in one line. You could do it in two lines, but there's no reason to really. So what we do is we have three times a bunch of gobbledygook. So we're going to have to say three times, three multiplied by. And then the gobbledygook all needs to be in parentheses to get that to happen. Now this is y over some gobbledygook. So we're going to do inside the parentheses y divided by. And now we have gobbledygook, which is more than one thing, so we use parentheses there. And then the Z plus 1 goes there. Now, are we good with that, or do I need to break, draw on the board about it? You're absolutely free to say that you need me to go over it. And I wouldn't count off, but I and T should be lowercase. But I know that when you type stuff into Word, it up, uppercases everything when you don't want it to. All right, lastly, write some code that dis implements this logic. If age is greater than 99, display, wow, man, you're old. Answer goes in a box here. If age is greater than 99, brace, braces are good. They're not strictly necessary because if you're only using one line of code in the block rather than multiple lines, you can get away with leaving the braces out. However, there's no reason to. C out, wow, man, you're old, slash in. Very good. Then if you tried to cut and paste this code, it wouldn't work, unfortunately, because Word puts those backwards quotes and forward quotes in there, and C doesn't know what to do with them, so you'd have to delete those and repaste them. All righty, pound sign include. What is the include statement? Include IO stream. That's what gives us CIN and C out. And then the namespace. What is the using statement we use so that we don't have to put std in front of cin and cout. It's using namespace std. Alrighty. If you were one of those people who said I didn't understand one of the problems, did we cover it adequately? You know, I was using it on the Mac and it didn't convert that equation. I just deleted it completely. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah. That's using that, what is that called, word, um, letters, or what, what do they call that editor in, on the Mac? Anyways, okay. Somebody asked me if they could print this out and bring it in, so I don't know who was the one who was going to print it out and bring it in. Um, feel free to correct it and just, and I'll, I'll just give you a grade for it. I, because I'm assuming that everybody has made the corrections, and if you upload it now, you're going to get 100. So everybody go ahead and do that. I'm not going to even grade them. I'm going to assume that you got them right. If you're not going to upload it and you want me to grade them and give you less than 100, I can do that if you want. Okay, so that, that is a pretty good review. Can you go down a little bit? Sure, sorry. I'm scrolling up and down. Which one are you wanting to look at? About the only thing this didn't cover would be order of precedence. I mean, it did a little bit of that with the uh, three times 
you know, it didn't do very much of that. So actually it did cover that. Anything that we've done in an in-class assignment would be really fair game to include on the exam and any of the notes that we have uploaded. This here covers the vast majority of it. There shouldn't be much that I'm covering today that would get thrown on it unless it's stuff that we've already covered in the past as well. Feels low energy today. I don't know if I'm tired or feel... Who, who lost power last night? I did, and I killed one of my fish. The filter wasn't going. So now I'm going to have to spend money to get a battery-powered pump for my fish tank so that if it ever goes out again, it doesn't kill more fish. I almost lost my computer. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I did not run around and unplug all of my equipment, and I usually do that when the, when the power goes out so that it comes back with a surge. It doesn't blow stuff up. Okay, more mathematical library functions. If you need to do stuff like sine, cosine, tangent, square root, absolute value, there's a header file you can include. CMath. So put pound sign and in, include CMath up at the top, and then you get all your old uh, functions that you had to learn in junior high and stuff like that. You know, sine and cosine and tangent. I'm not going to give you any assignments that require any of those, but square root is a useful one. You know, how do you take the square root of 10? It'd be really difficult to write your own program to do that. You could, but it would be far, far easier just to do pound sign include C math and go for it. So that looks like this. I want to take the square root of something. So along with IO stream and string, I would do pound sign include C math. And then I could do like print SQRT of 10. And I'll be able to find the square root of 10, which is be a little bit larger than 3. I have my divide by zero in there, so it's giving me fits. Stop that. Looks almost like pi. 3.16228. Okay, so if you need math functions, a lot of them are built in. If you want to get pi, for example, it is defined as a constant in one of the mat in one of the libraries, but it's not in the obvious one. It's not in CMath, I do not believe, at least on Windows. It's really a drag. Okay, let's see here. What's next? There are more mathematical libraries. You need CSTD Lib. There's one like RMD. R, A, and D, which returns a random number and the largest integer that the computer can hold. It yields the same sequence of numbers each time the Roman the uh, program is run. So that's kind of fun. If you want to generate some random numbers to play games with, if you want to write a dice game, you would want to include that function. So that function was CSTDLib. And then let's generate a series of 10 random numbers. I could use a for loop or a while loop. I do not recall talking about for loops yet. Have we done for loops? I don't think so. Doesn't sound right. Okay, so we're going to just make a counter. We're going to set it equal to 0, and we're going to count while it's less than 10. So while counter is less than 10, counter plus plus, that'll let us do 10 things, and we're going to generate 10 random numbers. The function to generate random numbers is RAND. So int num is equal to RAND parentheses in parentheses. And now let's print it out. And there we go. 18, 4, 6, 7, 41, 6, 3, 3, 4, 26. Okay, see, they're all random numbers until we get to that square root of 10. And if I run it again, I get the same numbers, 41, 18, 4, 6, 7, 3. Every time I run them, I'm going to get the same values. 
that's not really very random, is it? Like, if you were playing Yahtzee with somebody, do you notice that every single time they rolled, they got the same order of numbers? You know? Then uh, you'd wonder what kind of dice they were using. So, you have to seed the random number generator with what with a value that looks to the computer random. And usually people just use the time, the number of seconds in the day or that it is right now, or the number of seconds since the computer was rebooted. Because that's essentially random. There's no way to predict how many seconds it's been since the computer was rebooted. And each time you play it, that value will be different. So we would need to seed the random number generator with a value in order to get it to generate numbers that look more realistically random. So the next thing that we're going to do after this, and then we're going to take a break, this will probably take about 30 or 40 minutes, is we're going to write a dice game called Craps. And Craps is a dice game where you're trying to roll, you roll the dice, and if you get a 7 or 11, you win right away. If you roll a 2, 3, or 12, you lose right away. And if neither one of those things happen, then whatever you rolled in becomes your target, and you keep rolling until either you get that or you get a 7, which bombs you out. So we'll explain those rules again, and we'll write a dice program that does that. But in order to get that to work, we need this random number generator to actually give us better random numbers than it is right now. So we need to figure out how to use srand in order to get that work. And we're going to feed it the results of a time function. time function is not defined, so we need to pound sign include defunct the uh, library with, with time in it. Time.h will give it to us. Okay, so I'm going to come in here and add yet another library. Pound sign include time.h. There we go. Error build errors. The rand function does not take one argument. I, I put that in the wrong place. That was my mistake. Actually, S rand seed the random number generator. There are better ways, better algorithms for calculating random numbers than what C++ uses. You know, the NSA and other people who are attacking codes randomly want really true random numbers, and so they use different algorithms that are guaranteed to give more random numbers that don't follow the same patterns every time. Okay, at least it generated a different series of numbers. It started off with 7239. Now I'm going to run it again. 7265. Well, it's still in the 7,000 range, but that's okay. 7278. At least it's changing every time. Now, we want these numbers, if we're writing a dice game, to be between 1 and 6. So the way we do that is we get our random number, we modulus it by 6, and that gives us a value between 0 and 5 and then we add one to it to make it one between one and six. So this is what our function, our code that generates a random number between one and six looks like now. And so we rolled a six, a one, a five, a one, a one, a four, a six, a four, and a three, and so on. Okay, we now know enough to write our game. for the game on. Can you all see when I roll this up and then write on the board, or is that too bright? In the other room, people said that it, the light was so bright they could not see at all. Okay. Okay, so the rules are your first roll. You have a first roll. There's a name for it. Who cares what the name is? If your first roll is a 7 or 11, yay, you win. If your first roll is a 2, 3, or 12, bummer, you lose. Start the recording. I should be typing this off. Okay, alrighty. If 
neither one of these cases are true, then whatever you roll becomes the target. So this is an if, this is an else if, and this is an else. Now we need some kind of flag to indicate that the game is over so that we don't, you know, go into this while loop that we're about to enter. So we're going to set a Boolean flag up here called game over, and we're going to set it equal to false. So game over is equal to false. If we get either a win or a lose, we will be setting that game over equal to true. So set game over, I just that kind of a note to myself, set game over, okay. After all that, we're going to do a while. While game over is equal to false because we're going to keep rolling our dice, a pair of dice, until we get our target, unless we've already won or lost. And then, so then we will roll again, and if you roll a seven, then bummer, you lost. If you roll your target, which was the first number that you rolled up here, as long as it wasn't a two, three, seven, or eleven, then that's a good news. And either bad news or good news, a win or a loss also needs to set the game over flag. All right. Let's see if we can get this going. Start a new project, new solution. Just put all this stuff in it and tack on your name up at the top. Okay, I would really like a function that I could call that would give me the, my die roll so I don't have to use that complicated, uh, that complicated expression. So let's write a function called get roll. Or roll die, roll, yeah. Roll dice. And it's going to use the random function and return two of them added up together. So int d1, like die1, is equal to rend. Modulus 6 plus 1. That gets us a value between 1 and 6. D2 is equal to RND modulus 6 plus 1. The total is equal to D1 plus D2. And let's return the total. We have written a function. This is how we define a function. Function looks just like our main, except it has a different name up there. You can define what it returns. If it doesn't return anything, you put the word void there. If it returns a float, you put a float there, the word float. And then you have several lines of code, one or more lines of code between the braces. That is the body of the function. If this function was going to go below main, we would have to put what's known as a prototype. And I'm going to do that just to demonstrate it. So I'm going to take these lines of code, and it doesn't matter if you do this, and paste it below main. But I have to define a prototype. A prototype is a function definition, but without a body of a code. Instead, it just ends in a semicolon. You do that so that when we call the code, the compiler knows the format of the function, that it takes no parameters and that it, roll, it returns an int. So you're defining your function up as a prototype, and then you can put this in the same code, or you can even put it in a different file. However, if you put the function above where you call it, if you put it above main, then you don't have to use a prototype. So you, want us to copy and paste it where? you don't have to do that, but if you want to, copy it, paste it, put it below main, and put a prototype for it above it. Okay, so for our first roll, we're going to need a flag. Let's do two flags, a win-lose flag and a game-over flag. So bool game over equals false, win is equal to false. We haven't won yet, and the game's not over.
And let's keep track of how many times we roll. So let's keep a, a, a counter called rolls. We'll start it off at one, but then in our while loop, we may start increasing it, or we will start increasing it. So for the first roll, we need to get our dice. So int roll is equal to roll dice. No, I don't want to use the word roll there because we've already used rolls and that's too similar. So I'm going to call it dice. Int dice is equal to roll dice. And that would be a number between 2 and 12. Randomly generated. Except this time they're always the same values because we have not seeded it. Make sure that you get the pound sign includes that we did. You want C STD lib, C standard lib, and you want time.h, as well as our usuals. I don't think we're going to use C math. We're not going to calculate the sine of a die roll or a tangent of a, you know. Okay, so now we have our if statement. If what we roll is a 7 or, and here's the or symbol, shift backslash above the inner key. Two bars like that. That's the shift backslash above the inner key. If dice is equal to 7 or dice is equal to 11, great. Let's print a message. See out U1 on the first roll. You know our, uh, our die roll function is missing something. It doesn't actually print out what the user rolled. So maybe we ought to put that here. Nah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, nah, I lied. I'm gonna leave it alone. And if they win, then we want to set win equal to true, and we want to set game over equal to true. And I forgot a very important variable definition. So I'm going to mark it with a whole bunch of exclamation marks. You need to come back up here and add this line. Int target is equal to zero because we need something that holds our target if we don't roll a 7, 11, or 2, 3, or 12. Make sure you get that line in there. did not win automatically, there's a possibility that we lost, which is if you roll a 2, 3, or 12 with your two dice. Else, if dice is equal to 2, or dice is equal to 3, or dice is equal to 12, then we print, you lost on the first roll. Bummer, dude. And we set win equal to false, game over equal to true. I'm going to move my braces up so that they're on the same line as the ifs, just to save myself a little, little, itty bitty bit of space. And if neither one of those cases is true, or it's not a 7 or 11 or a 2, 3 or 12, then whatever we just rolled becomes our target. Instead of putting Dice. The I don't think I'll work. Let's compile it this way and then let's try it like that. Okay. It says you lost on the first roll. But it didn't tell me what I rolled. And since it's not a true random number, it's going to continue to say you lost on the first roll. See if it does the same for you. Run it and see if you get a, uh, a you lost on the first roll message. And you're suggesting that we say if dice is equal to 2, comma, 3, comma, 12. That would be a cool syntax, but it's not supported by the compiler. Now it's gonna you're gonna show me that it is. Okay, how did you know that was gonna work? Were you sure that was gonna work or you would no, I was just curious. Okay. 
That's not how you do it, so I have no idea what it is actually doing. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, I'm going to have to research what that is doing, but it's not doing our check. <laughs> okay, so there's our code. Run it, make sure it prints. You lost in the first roll. If you're getting syntax errors or whatever, I need to come back and help you. If you're not typing as fast as I am, that's totally okay. I will slow down. I'm going to scroll and put the roll dice function back on the screen. Some of us don't have that typed in. Here's what the roll dice function does. Looks like. And then you have to put a prototype for that roll dice function up above main. And a prototype just means that you copy this first line of the function you paste it above main and put a semicolon after it.
got it working? Got a couple more? Okay. Lining C out. Okay. If you need arrow, arrow, one. I think it works. Good deal. still have to call this one main. So roll dies. It should be fine separately. So go down to the bottom of your code now and you type in the uh, six lines you see right there for the roll dies. Oh, I see. Sorry. Okay, yeah, grab those. Or undo my changes and make their appropriate fix. Let's just hang with it and we'll come back and try to fix that after we type the next chunk of code. Alright guys, we've handled the first roll, now the second roll, and all subsequent rolls, we're trying to roll the target, which is the value that we rolled if we didn't immediately win or lose. So above this system pause, we're going to put a while statement. While game over is equal to false. We need to get our roll again, our dice. If they roll their target, great, they won. So if dice is equal to target, see how. Now, let's not even display anything. Let's just set our switches. Game over is equal to true. 
win is equal to true. That's a winning condition. Else, if dice is equal to seven, that's an that's an automatic lose. Game over is equal to false. No, game over is equal to true because that ended the game. But win is equal to false. And then lastly, we want to increment the number of rolls so we can tell the user how many times it took. So after that if statement, we're going to put rolls plus plus. that stuff, after the while loop is over, then we need to print out whether they won or they lost. So let's do an if statement. If win is equal to true, then we will see out u1 in or you won with else see out you lost with Now it's almost perfect except we're still not printing out what they roll and we're also not telling them what they need to try to roll. And we're not pausing. So to do that stuff, we're going to have to modify our get, our dice roll, our roll dice function. It's not the only way we could do this, but it seems like a good place to do it to me. Okay, so I'm going to go down here to roll dice. Let's stick a pause in it. Nah, let's do this a good way. Care ch cin dot get. Well, we have to also print something. C out. This is kind of a drag. We're, we're completely modifying roll dice. C out. Press enter to roll the dice. I made the arrows go the wrong way on that one. Cin into ch. Nope, that's not right. C-I-N dot get into C-H. That's our pause. And then we want int D1 is equal to, int D2 is equal to. And I had somebody just return D1 plus D2, but that's not good enough because we need to print it out. So make sure you do this. Int total is equal to D1 plus D2, and then tack on one more line, which is to say what they rolled. You rolled a... like that. Okay, we need two more changes after that, but I don't want to keep going until I know that everybody's got this working. One is that we need to initialize the random number generator with the time so that you don't get the same rolls every time. Go ahead and run it again, and you're still going to get the error if you're doing this on the, uh, the PC that uh, you lost on the first roll. And that's okay. 
we haven't changed that logic, so it's okay for that to still be the same message. But it ought to have this new improved functionality. Press enter to roll the dice and then displaying what you rolled. So now it's telling us, hopefully, that the first roll was a 12. So we know that part will either it's gold. Yeah. Okay. All right, it looks like some of y'all have already got the random number portion correct. If it's still rolling 12 every time, go ahead and hit enter. There's a bit of code we have to add, which is that we need to initialize the random number generator. So go ahead and scroll back up, and above where it says first roll, as part of main. I'm not sure what you said. Hey, Siri. <laughs> I'm listening. Oh, no. Tell me about it, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> what was that again? I'm really sorry I did that. Okay. So, S Rand, see this with the return value of the time function. That'll make us get random numbers, and the game will be more fun to play. And the other fix is that we aren't telling it what the target is. 
So after you add this, go down to our while game is equal to false loop right there and make the first line of that equal to this. See out your target is to roll a target ENDL. Now it ought to be an actual game. Press enter to roll the dice. You roll the nine. Your target is to roll a nine. Press enter to roll the dice. You roll an eight, but you want a nine. You rolled a nine. It took you one with three rolls. Now hopefully, the second time I run it, I'm not going to get the same sequence of numbers. Press enter to roll. You rolled a seven. You won on the first roll. I'm the champion. I'm the champion. Okay, here we go. Let's do it one more time. Press enter to roll the dice. You rolled a six. That becomes our target. You rolled a ten. You rolled an eight. You rolled a seven. All right. Now, eventually, after the fourth, I'm going to ask y'all to turn this into a program that will run continually like 100 times, counting how many times you win out of 100. And so you'll want to take out all the pauses in order to do that, and you'll want to count the number of wins. But we're not going to do that now. Okay, did everybody get this running, or do anybody need? Okay. Alrighty guys, here is the logic for the program that we just wrote in diagram form, in flowchart form. And this is actually done for a different class, and so it doesn't look exactly like C++. But on the other hand, it doesn't exactly look like Python, which is a class that it was done for. And the reason for that is, is that a flowchart isn't supposed to match any very specific syntax. It's just a, a description of logic. You know, the flowchart is not the computer code, just like a map to Walmart is not the car. It just tells you how to program the computer to do what you want it to do. So here's our, here's our code. Set target equal to zero, set win equal to false, set game over is equal to true. Then we roll our dice. Here we store the variable called total rather than a variable called uh, dice. Print the total. Well, actually, we wound up doing that inside the roll dice function. If total is equal to 7 or total is equal to 11, we print you won on the first roll, and we set game over equal to true, and we set win equal to true. Now, this flow chart, I forgot that you could roll the 2 or the 12 and lose. Otherwise, there should have been another else if statement down here. If that's not true, if it wasn't a 7 or 11, then the else statement was to set the target equal to the roll. That's the end of the if. Now, in a flowchart, the lines can go any which way, but, you know, in the, in the program, they just go down. But in order to fit all this on one page, I made the line go back up here to the top. Now, here's our while loop. Here's what a while loop looks like in a flowchart. It's got your diamond shape up here, while game over is equal to false. And then it executes the body of the loop. And then when it hits that closing brace, it comes back and it checks again. Is game over still equal to false? If so, it does all this stuff again. And it keeps repeating that code until game over is no longer equal to false, at which point it either tells you whether you won or you lost. Now, this is a slightly simplified version that doesn't keep track of the number of rolls. And so here's our logic here. If the target is what we roll, we print, or we set game over equal to true and set win equal to true. Else, if the target is equal to 7, then we lost. We set game over equal to true, but we set win equal to false. And doing either one of those things, setting game over equal to true, breaks us out of the while loop. And that exits us, and we use that win flag to determine whether we print a you won message or a you lost message. So that's a, that's a graphical representation of it. And this isn't uh, programming 1113, which is where you focus on flowcharts. So we're not going to be drawing flowcharts in here as far as I can predict. Or if we do, I'll be drawing them with you. And then there was a function. We wrote a function. The roll dice function looks very similar, although the syntax is different. Print, print, hit enter to continue. Set roll equal to, and it generates a random number there. Now that language has a different function for getting random numbers. Here's another one for getting a random number between 1 and 6. And then it gets the total, which is equal to one, roll 1 plus roll 2. It prints your roll is, and then it returns that. So here's how the function call is uh, shown. 
the, de the function definition is shown in the flow chart. And so when it is invoked, we just color coded it to make sure that it really jumped out. Here's the first time we roll the dice in order to do our initial win loss, and then in our while loop, we roll the dice again. All right. So we use the square root function, or at least I demoed it. If you wanted to do any of those, you would use CMath. I don't think I'm going to ask you a question about whether which, which header file you have to use for the math functions because we haven't written anything that requires these yet. If you want a random number, and you know random numbers always make the programs more interesting, then we would need C standard lib. Hand tracing a program. I am going to skip this. It's, no, it's kind of useful. I'm still going to skip it. I'll come back and do a hand tracing of my own rather than their example. So the way the exam is going to work on Wednesday is we're going to do lecture for about an hour and then we'll start the exam. And so the exam will also last, you know, probably only take you 30 to 45 minutes, but you have, you know, like two hours past that point actually to get it done. And it's open notes, meaning you can bring notes and you can bring your book. And it's also open anything that's uploaded into D2L. I don't really want you to just hit Google and uh, search for the answer there. I want you to use the resources, you know, the notes that you've either taken or that have been uploaded to D2L. If you get confused by something, raise your hand. You know, I'll come help you. If, uh, if you're tempted to Google something, I can't stop you because I'm up here, so I'm depending upon all of y'all to spy on each other. No, I'm kidding. Don't spy on each other. Okay. So let's go to the next chapter. That was chapter three. The only stuff that will be on the exam is stuff are chapters one, two, and three, specifically chapters two and three, because that's the stuff that we've covered. And more specifically, it's going to be largely on what that review was, plus any other in-class assignments that we've done. So, if you look over the in-class assignments and understand the programs that you wrote for your homework, and by the way, I graded homework with an iPad program that set all of my feedback to draft rather than to posted, and so you didn't get your feedback on it, I will get those converted over and uh, post it for you so that you can check, check your, uh, your homework grades tomorrow. And if you don't get a good grade, if you get like a 50% or a 20% or a 1% or whatever, it doesn't mean you did bad at it. It doesn't mean that you failed it. It just is an invitation for you to correct it and submit it again. So just remember that. If you get a bad grade on the program, on an assignment, you can modify it and upload it again for more credit. All righty. That was Chapter 3. Look. Pardon me? This one we are going to put in the Dropbox. That is absolutely correct. Thank you for reminding me. I hope the DICE program was interesting. What I really wanted you to see was a couple of things. I wanted you to see the f how we define a function and how we call the function and how we prototype the function. The prototype for the function goes up at the top, and then the functions can go underneath. If you wanted to put that function above main rather than underneath main, you wouldn't have to prototype it. But you don't want to get in the habit of expecting that because you may need to put that code in a separate file. You know, usually a program doesn't just consist of one file. These are short programs. We can fit them in one file. Most projects that you work on in the real world may consist of dozens of files. So you will have a header file that defines it, the uh, prototypes for your functions. Why did we modularize it like that? So that uh, we could change the way that it worked. You know, we made it pause and we made it display the function just by going to one place in the code. And that changed it for both places where the roll dice function was called. If we hadn't done that, then each time we wanted to uh, generate the random number, we would have to put all of this code right there. So, you know, here when I roll the dice right here, it would have to have all those lines of code right there. That's just not exactly formatted. And then later on, when we roll the dice a second time, it would have to have all those lines of code there. If you find yourself copying and pasting code to a different place in your program, just think to yourself, oh, that should be a function. Especially if you paste it more than once. You know, 
two times in your program is, is kind of on the fence. If your code has more, you know, if you're copying and pasting more than twice, it absolutely ought to be a function. And also, if it's more than just a couple of lines of code, then it ought to be a function so that it's easy to maintain. It's easy to come back in. If we decided we were going to play this dice game with D&D uh, &D Dungeons & Dragons dice and we wanted to make them 20 ciders, then we would go down here and change the 6 to 20. And then the pro we would recompile it and run it, and then the program would operate with a different logic. And we only had to change it to one place because it was modularized into a function. The other thing I wanted you to see was the OR syntax. If something or if something. There's also an AND. AND means both sides have to be true. So that's an example of an OR. That means that if it's a 7 or an 11, either side can be true and then the result will be executed. You know, whatever's in here. We will, we will display you win if it's a 7 or if it's an 11. And if it's not either, we will not display you win. Then there are ands. So this is or. Whenever you see those two vertical bars, you're supposed to say or. And is written with two ampersands, which is shift 7. And both of those have to be true. Like, say, you're trying to decide whether you're going to go out for dinner or not. There are two variables involved, hungry and have money. Because if you're hungry but don't have money, you can't go out to eat, unless you have a credit card. If you have money but you're not hungry, there's no point in going out to eat. So if hungry is equal to true and have money is equal to true, except we replace the and with the symbol for it. Both of those have to be true for us to go out to eat. So that's AND and OR, and then there's a third logical operator, NOT, which is an exclamation mark. So you could do something like this. If game over and not win, so the game is over but we didn't win, then we would print out you lose. Else, if game over and win, then we print you win. And if neither one of those are true, then our dangling else, our final else, would be to say, you haven't won. Keep playing. Like that. So if you see an exclamation mark, say not. Sometimes you'll see it written like this, if x not equal to 0. You know. So not is written like that, and it just reverses it. If this was true, it turns it into a false. If it was false, it turns it into a true. Now we're going to make a little table for trues and falses. If you're doing ors, then only one of them has to be true for the answer to be true. So let's do a, b, and then a or b. So if a is false and B is false, then A or B is false, right? We're not going to go, we, we didn't win, we didn't roll a 7 and we didn't roll an 11, so we haven't won yet. If A is false but B is true, then the result is true because only one side of it has to be true. If A is true and B is false, the answer is true. If A is true and B is true, then the answer is true. That's a truth table for OR. Here's a truth table for AND. And I see lots of people not watching, so I hope this doesn't come up on an exam. A, B, A, and B. And I know that maybe this looks a little bit abstract, but it's just trying to burn the idea in in a different way. So both of these have to be true. This is like the... Um, hungry and have money, you know. If you're not hungry and you don't have money, then we don't go out. So those result in a fa false, if they're both false. If one of them is true, you have money, but you're not hungry, 
it still falls. If you are hung, if you, whatever. The opposite still, still falls. falls, but there we go. That's the only true. Okay, so notice that the only false for an or is when you have two f's, two falses. Notice that the only true for an and is when they're both true. And there's one more way to look at it. If you think of f as being 0 and trues as being 1, like this. I'm going to grab this again. Except I'm going to rewrite it with zeros. And you pretend, not pretend, if you say that or is equal to a plus, well, what's 0 plus 0? Zero? 0. What's 0 plus 1? One. 1. What's 1 plus 0? Zero? 1. What's 1 plus 1? Well, in this universe, there's only zeros and 1s, so we're going to say that that's that. So that's the truth table for plus using binary digits, and it's the same logic as for or. This is another version of the or truth table expressed in binary math. Now let's do the and truth table. When you're doing the, the truth table with binary numbers and and, then you do multiply. So what's zero times zero? Yep, zero. What's zero times one? Zero. Whoops. One times zero. Zero. And then one times one is one. So if you come back up here and you note, if you replace that with and, and the uh, trues with ones and the s with zeros, the pattern is the same. And then there's good old not. If you have a is being 0 or 1, then not a is the opposite. Well, I meant to do true or false, sorry. There. What's the opposite of false? True. true. What's the opposite of true? False. OK. So you use those inside of if statements to build expressions. You know, If temperature is less than 32 or temperature is greater than 212. That's the boiling point and the freezing point and the boiling point, respectively. Then we print water is a liquid. Now let's write one with an AND statement. If temperature is greater than or equal to 32 and the temperature is less than or equal to 212, then it's still water. This one checks to see if it's outside of the range. I goof that one up, y'all. Y'all let me goof it. I blame all of y'all. It's not my fault. If it's less than 32, it's freezing, so the water is not a liquid. If it's greater than 212, it's boiling, so the water is not a liquid. But now we've reversed the logic of it. If the temperature is greater than 32 and the temperature is less than 212, that means it falls between the points, and the water is a liquid. So that's an example of writing an or. That's an example of writing an and. I never did make my Dropbox for this. Let's do that now. I am recording, right? OK. H is our dice program. All right, refresh your Dropbox, and at the bottom of the Dropbox on H, you'll see the dice program. And by the way, if your thing is set to display only like 10 or 20 per page, you may as well set it to 200 per page, so it'll display all of them no matter what. Sometimes. You know, as we get more assignments, you'll, you'd have to click to go on to the next page, and people get frustrated that they can't find the assignment immediately. So I would, I would like your CPP file. You really don't have to upload the whole thing if you just give me the CPP file. 
Give, giving me the zip is great if you want to zip up the whole thing, but I really, really need the CPP. So if you want to save yourself some time, you can just grab the CPP. On the other hand, if you zip up the whole thing, then you have the project for yourself at home. So, you know, if you ever download it again as a project, your choice. Chapter 4, which is not on Wednesday's exam, making decisions. We're going to be able to whiz through this one pretty dang quickly because we already know about decisions. We already know about if statements. And we just talked about or and and. So I bet we can do this one in two minutes flat. No, that's a little optimistic. Here we go. Relational operators. We know how these work. If something's greater than the other. If x is greater than 10. Less than if y is less than 20, greater than or equal to, if x is greater than or equal to 100, less than, if x is less than or equal to 90, that kind of thing, equal to. If you're going to check to see if x is equal to 3 or if die roll is equal to 7 or whatever, you have to use two equal signs, not one. And by the way, no, I'm not going to even go there. And then that's not equal to. So here are some examples. Here's an, a relational expression. A Boolean expression is one that evaluates to true or false. Before this, our expressions have been math, you know, x plus 5, x plus x times y, that kind of stuff. That was math. This is doing Boolean. Boolean means true or false. It was invented by a guy named George Boole. He was the guy who decided to invent math where there were only two numbers in the universe, 0 and 1, and you know, that's why you add, add, wind up with that funny truth table, you know where it's all the answers are either zeros or ones and ands and ors. So 12 greater than 5, that evaluates the truth. So if we did if 12 greater than 5, then it would go ahead and go in that code block and do that line. If 7 less than 5, that's not true. So if we did if 7 less than 5, do the code block, it wouldn't do it. Now that's dumb. You wouldn't not word something like this, right? But you, you might put a variable in for one of those. You might say x is less than or equal to 5, and then it suddenly becomes useful. So here we go. What about if x is 10? Is it possible I can delete these fast enough you don't memorize them? All right. So if x is 10, does that evaluate to true or false? Is x equal to 10? Uh, yep. Okay. Is x not equal to 8? That is true because it's 10. It's not equal to 8. Is x equal to 8? False. We could tack some other ones on. Is x greater than 7? That's true. Is x greater than 8? No, let's make it x greater than 10. Is x greater than 10? It's actually not. Yeah, it's false. But what about, lastly, x greater than or equal to 10? Yep, that's true. You can assign the result of an expression like that to a variable, or you can put it in the if statement. So if you have the choice of doing something like this, x is equal to 10, if x is equal to 10, you could do it that way, or you could store the result in a temporary variable of some kind. You could say x is equal to 10, then you could do match is equal to x equal to 10, or is match or whatever, and then you could use that inside your if statement, if is match. Both of those do the same thing. These are equivalent, this is equivalent code. So an expression, a relational expression that returns a Boolean variable, can be stored in a variable, just like a normal math expression could be stored in a variable. But in this would have to be defined as type bool for that to work. I guess we may as well put a type for these as well. Bool means Boolean, which means a variable that's either true or false. Why would you do it like that? 
Well, if this expression was long and had a lot of equals and greater thans and ands and ors, it might be a good idea to calculate that result, store it in a variable, and then do the if statement on it. Because you might want to print out that value in between those two times, you know. Or, uh, you know, you might want to set a debug on it at that point so that you can figure out the logic. Otherwise, you could just do it like this. If it's this short of an expression, there's no reason at all to not just put it in something like that. But if it's a complex expression involving a lot of different terms and operators, then it might be a good idea to solve that expression, store the results in a variable, and then do your if statement based on that. The if statement allows statements to be conditionally executed or skipped over. It models the way we think about things. If raining, take umbrella. If cold, wear a coat. If raining and cold, take umbrella and coat. Flow chart it like that. The if statement's a diamond. If cold, yes, wear a coat. Then there's the else statement. The else is when you have a line coming out the other side and you're doing something else, another block on the other side. You can do more than one thing. If it's cold, you wear a coat. You wear a hat and you wear gloves. If you're doing more than one thing after your if statement, that's when you have to have the brace. So that's why we use braces to set, you know, when equal to true and game over equal to true because we had more than one statement after our if statement. So the way we write this is if cold is equal to true or whatever, and then brace, and then our, all of our statements, and then our end brace. And this is the body of the if statement. It's the code that is attached to that if statement. The general format is like that. If something, brace, our statement, in brace. And when I said nothing from chapter 4 will be on it, if statements are going to be on there because we've covered them more than once. That's why it was on the review. Okay, there we go. If we do that, it breaks the code. It no longer works. And it's so easy to do that. I've done it. Why does that break the code? Because it treats it like this. It treats it like there's a little hidden invisible body of code with nothing in it. So if this expression is true, it executes what's in the braces. If it's not true, well, there's no else statement, so nothing happens. Well, so now nothing's going to happen either way, and then it executes this statement no matter what. So putting a semicolon after the end of an if statement or a while statement just totally breaks the code. I guarantee there will be more than one person who does that. It may be me. Okay. So the way we read it is that there's an expression, that's your conditional expression. It is evaluated into a Boolean value, either true or false, and if this is true, then it executes that statement. If the expression is false, this statement is skipped. Do not place a semicolon after the expression. I just said that. It's good, it's good clean programming style to put the statement on a separate line. You don't have to do that. We could do this. We could do if score is greater than 90, grade is equal to A, all in one line. But that's not considered good programming style. Whether you put braces on a single statement like this is up to your programming preferences. I recommend doing it, but then when I'm typing stuff in here and I'm trying to get the most code as possible to fit on one screen, sometimes I'll leave it out. So that is the same as doing it without. Like that. And if I can make the code look pretty by having a whole bunch of if statements, then sometimes, you know, line up, then sometimes I will do it like that. Else if grade greater than 80 grade is equal to B, you know, that kind of thing. Else if grade is greater than 70, grade is equal to C. Else grade is equal to F. Like that. That's, they're saying that that's bad formatting. I could kind of agree, but it's also pretty easy to read. It's up to you. This is more correct, according to them better programming style. What's going on there? Okay. Like that. Why?
why is it recommended that you put braces there if even if there's only one line of code? So what? Yeah. So you don't get like a C if you make a 90? Yeah, so that if you go back and add a second line of code, it doesn't break it. We had some code that looked like this. If dice is equal to 7 or dice is equal to 11, then set game over equal to true. That's great code. But then what happens if we decide, oh yeah, I also needed to set that win flag. That is not valid code. Looks valid. Looks great. But here's what it really is. It treats it like it's like this. Which is not good. That's not what you want. You don't want the win. I don't know why I set it equal to flag. You don't want win set to true no matter what. And that's what happens here. Whether you in, are ending the game or not, you're setting win equal to true. And that's because only one line after the if statement is executed if you don't use braces. So I hope you see that this is wrong because the compiler treats it like this. Now, so we fix it. If dice is equal to 7 or dice is equal to 11, let's make another mistake. Let's put the semicolon there. Game over is equal to true. Win is equal to true. Looks great. Still not good. And the reason why is because it, the compiler treats it like this. a little empty thing there and then this code after that gets executed no matter what non-conditionally that doesn't look good so the only way to do it correctly is like this without the semicolon so again, that's why people recommend putting the braces around it, even if it's one statement, because doing it with like that invites people to come along and then add this line of code and expect it to be conditional part of that if statement. Maybe they're Python programmers where you can get away with that, but you can't get away with that in C. In Python, all your uh, levels of indention are set just by how far they are indented, not uh, by the braces. So different language, different way of doing things. All right, we're not going to have an assignment given today because I don't think it's fair to give you an assignment and then expect you all to also, you know, have time tomorrow to review for the exam. So as we get a little bit closer, we'll call it a day. Okay, call it an evening. If else, if else gives you two paths of execution. You do one statement if the expression is true, else you do the other statement if the expression is not true. Like this, if expression, do that else do that. So if expression is true, then statement one gets executed. If expression is false, then statement one is skipped and it performs statement two instead. So, you know, if hungry is equal to true, see out, let's eat. Else yeah. No thanks. I'll wait. <coughs> Keep pulling that up and that's not what I want. Usually the next scene I show is a, uh, there we go. So if the number modulus 2 is equal to 0, it means that the number is even. You might print out even. If number modulus by 2 is not equal to 0, that means it's 1, and it means that the number is odd because you cannot divide it by 2 evenly. So when I diagram things like this, I'll put a true statement, but then I'll put false slash else. 
just to make absolutely clear that there's an else clause involved. That's my own variation. Okay. Nested if statements. You can embed if statements inside of if statements. A nested if is when you put an if statement inside the code block for another if statement. You could do something like this. If game over is equal to true, and by the way, you can leave off the equals true. This, you could word this just as if game over. If game over is equal to true, then if win is equal to true, we're going to print you win. Else, we're going to print you lose. And if that's not true, we're going to print keep playing. So this illustrates ifs and elses, and it also illustrates nested ifs. This if is inside this if. That should be pretty clear. Here we go. Here it is in flowchart form. If employee equals yes, okay, great. If we're a recent grad, yes, you qualify for the special interest rate. Now, if we're not a recent grad, then we get a message. Display, you must have graduated from college in the past two years to qualify. And if we weren't employed to begin with, it says you must be employed to qualify. Now, we could word this a little bit differently with an and statement and get about the same results. We could say if employee equals yes and recent grad equals yes, we could display you qualify for the special interest rate. The only problem with that is that we would not have these custom messages for what went wrong. We'd have to display something like you must have graduated from college and be employed. You can see why it's nested, I hope. It's like those Russian nesting dolls where you have a little bitty doll inside a bigger one, inside a bigger one. So this little bitty if statement's nested inside the bigger if statement. Nested if statements. Yeah. Use proper indentation. If you mess up your indentation, it gets harder to read. It tries to keep your code properly indented. If it ever gets all garbled, you can just come up here to uh, edit, advanced, format document, and it'll fix it to what it thinks is correct. And what it thinks is correct is to put the braces on the same line as the if, which I disagree with, but you know, it's fine. It is nicely formatted and it's consistent. I wonder why it's underlining that. I must have broken the code somehow. Expected a semicolon. That's the error you got. Oh, that's because I was doing my cutting and pasting and messing it up completely. All right. We didn't. We just covered if else. Why is it making us do it again? Oh, this is if else if. That tests a series of conditions until one is found to be true. And we used if, else, if. Here's the idea of the logic. If raining, take umbrella. Else, if windy, take hat. Why couldn't we do both? If it's windy, don't you leave your hat off because it'll blow away? Well, I don't know. I guess it's a tight hat. Else, take sunglasses. Yeah. And we used if, else's in our code like up in the beginning when we decided whether we roll, failed on our first roll or not. And so it looked like this. After we got our, our die roll, we checked. Did we roll a 7 or 11? If we did, great. Ta-da, we, we do all of that. Else, if we rolled a 2, 3, or 12, we do that. Else, and we have, we have a final dangling else right there. So what's important about if, else, ifs? What's important about if-else-ifs is that they are mutually exclusive. 
either this one or this one or this one will happen, but not multiple occurrences of those. And that can become important. What if we wrote code like this? If grade greater than 90, or if score greater than 90, grade equals A. If score greater than or equal to 80, grade is equal to B. If score is greater than or equal to 70, grade is equal to C. You know where this is going. Else, grade is equal to F. Looks like good code, but let's follow it through. Let's say that I earned 100. I'm really expecting an A. If score is greater than 90, is that true? Yeah, so we made an A. All right, now we're going to go to the next line. Is our score greater than 80? Yeah, so we also made a B. And then is our score greater than 70? Yep, so we also made a C. So by the time we come down here and we print out the grade, it's going to print out that we made a C. We don't want that. We want these to be mutually exclusive. We want to only execute either that one or that one or that one. And the way we do that is by putting else's in there. Is our grade greater than 90? It sure is. Awesome. Grade is equal to A. And then it skips down here and it prints it out. It skips all the rest. What if our grade was a 85? Is 85 greater than 90? No. So it skips that one. It comes back to here. Is grade greater than 80? It sure is because it's 85. So it does that and then it skips all the way down here. That's why you use else if, if the choices are supposed to be mutually exclusive. If they're not, then it's okay to leave the else's off. So let's put why this is bad logic. Bad logic. Why? Because the choices are not mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means that you only want one of them to happen. If your score is 100, it will set grade equal to A, B, and then C. And so here's the if-else format. If expression, do that. It can be a code block, in which case you have to use a braces. Else if expression, do that. Else if expression, do that. And then it's a good idea to tag along a final else at the very end, even if you don't expect it to ever get that far. If you don't ever expect it to get that far, you can just print else, print error condition, you know. Because there may be times when it works its way through all these if-else-ifs without hitting any of these statements. And you want to display some kind of error message to yourself. Here we go. If test score is greater than A, print you've made an A. Else if test score is greater than B, you made a B, and so on. And then there's a final catch-all. This else is the catch-all. If you didn't get any of those things, then it prints F. He's calling it a trailing else. Whatever. All right, flags. We've used the concept of flags. Our flag, with, we had two flags in our program. We had game over and we had win. It's a variable that signifies a condition. It's usually implemented as a bool. Or you could use an integer if you treated the integer as zero is false and a non-zero value is true. And you have to give it an initial value before it is used. And so a flag just holds a state that is important to you. While game over is equal to false. Game over is a flag, and when game over is set to true, it's going to fall out of that while loop. Logical operators. And, or, and not. We've talked about and, or pretty much already today. I think we are going to end the lecture here just a few minutes early.
checking numeric ranges with logical operators. We talked about that. Like if you want to test to see if something is a valid grade. If grade is greater than or equal to zero and grade is less than or equal to 100, you print valid grade. Or to test to see if it's outside of that range. If grade is less than zero or grade is greater than 100, you want to print invalid grade. Now this is actually wrong. He did this wrong. You would take those equals out. Because if you leave it like that, then it treats a grade of 100 as a valid, as an invalid grade. And we want students to earn 100s, so you'd have to change it like that to make it work. This is invalid notation. You can't say if 0 is less than or equal to grade, less than or equal to 100. Or you can't do if 32 is less than or equal to temperature, less than or equal to 212 to determine if it's a liquid water. You have to phrase it with a and and an or. If you're trying to establish something that's within a range, you tend to typically use and. If you're trying to determine if something is outside of a range, you typically use or. All right. Let's call this turkey done. Don't run out yet. I don't think I took.